my name is Quentin. <coughs> I work on Meta, and I am gonna talk for the next, maybe not how, uh, maybe not full hour um, about BP filter, which is a, a mechanism for packet filtering using BPF, uh, and we'll see how we can leverage that for IP cables and NF cables. So as I said just before, so my name is Quentin. I work at Meta in the Linux, Linux user space team. So we aim to contribute to open source projects such as systemd, uh, package management, um, and also BP filter, which we will discuss during this talk. So I've been working on this project since um, more than a year now, uh, and I am happy to present it to you. Um, so first of all, we could go back a bit. Uh, not the whole talk will be talking about IP cables. Uh, don't be afraid, but just to give you some context and to have some refresher about IP tables and how it works. Um, so IP tables is a quite old tool, it's from 1998. Um, and so it's a packet filtering uh, mechanism, which was um, up to some point a de facto standard uh, on Linux. And uh, the way IP tables is structured, uh, it's quite simple. We have the, the schema on the right. So basically you have different tables which can be NAT, Mangle, Filter, uh, and that table will define what kind of um, what kind of processing you want to do with IP tables. For this section and for this talk, we'll focus on filtering, which is filtering pa packets, basically. So we have the filter tables. Inside that, in sorry, the, the mic is keeps moving. Okay. Um, so we've got the filtering tables. In that table, we have different chains. The chains means where do you want to filter inside the network stack. Uh, for this example, we've got the input, forward, and output chains. And in each chain, in each chain, you can have one on or more rules. And the rules define a set of criteria. And when the criteria match the packet, then the action is applied. Uh, the first one we can see at the bottom here is if the packet is ICMP, then we drop it. Um, so. As I said, we will focus on filtering table for now. Um, when it comes to IP tables, the IP tables defined in 1998 is slightly different from the one you can use these days. Um, who knows about IP tables legacy? Yeah, so IP tables legacy is basically the IP tables from 1998, which communicates with the kernel using the syscalls get socopt and set socopt. Syscalls, is that clear? Does everyone know what a syscall is? Who knows what a syscall is? Who knows what a syscall is but would like me to explain for the other people in the room? Okay, so uh, syscall basically it's a way for a user space program to communicate with the kernel and to ask the kernel to, to perform like a privileged task. Uh, so IP tables, the binary running in user space, will call a kernel function which is get socopt or set socopt to perform something on the kernel side. Uh, now that we have the basics about IP tables, let's see how to use it. So the workflow is uh, quite simple. So you use IP tables, you call the IP tables, um, oh sorry, I just realized uh, explaining in syscalls. Uh, so IP tables legacy is using get socopt and set socopt and the IP tables you can use nowadays on your computer is using netlink to communicate with the kernel. That was the difference, my bad. So the um, workflow is pretty straightforward. So you call the IP tables binary on your machine, you give it some parameters. Uh, and if you want, for example, to create a new filtering rule, uh, IP tables will first use get socopt to get the whole rule set from the kernel. It's gonna modify it and send it back using set socopt. Uh, that's a quite heavy process. So if you have to insert a thousand rules, it's gonna uh, use get socopt a thousand times get the whole rule set, modify it, and send it back. It can be quite inefficient for huge rule sets. Um, and the data contained in the get socopt or set socopt call is binary. Uh, it's a specific stru structure defined in the in IP tables process. So what's wrong with it now? Well, it's quite old. Uh, it was defined, designed in 1998. And nowadays, the way we manage networks, the way we, the kind of traffic we have, the bandwidth we use is uh, completely different and quickly IP tables if you have a lot and a lot of rules can be a bottleneck when it comes to um, handling the traffic on your host. Uh, as an example, if you have let's say 128 rules 
to filter different IPs, then it starts to slow down and you won't have the full bandwidth. Um, it depends on your host, obviously, but. Um, so, yeah, so IP tables uh, is showing some limitation when it comes to modern usage of network. Um, and the thing is, IP tables have been for a long time the standard way to filter packets. Uh, that's what the command end, a lot of people use it. And when you have something that works, you don't really want to move to do something different, like the new, new and shiny stuff. So how, what can we do to improve IP tables, make it faster, while not forcing people to move on? Well, that's where come BPF into play. So uh, is, is everyone aware of what BPF is? Who doesn't know? Who knows but wants me to explain because of other people in the room? Okay, so BPF is a way to run inside the kernel, uh, to, to run user space code basically inside the kernel. So you write your BPF program and you can load it in the kernel and it's running within the kernel context um, and in a secure environment. So the program you load and you run in the kernel is verified for some specific constraint. Uh, and it's then run within the kernel itself. Originally, uh, BPF, which is actually called eBPF, uh, the one we use nowadays, BPF was uh, designed for packet filtering. Uh, it was created by Alexei Starobotov in 2014, uh, and it can be used to, to perform very efficient packet filtering. Uh, and we'll try to use that specificity to improve IP tables now. So how can we leverage it? So let's start with defining a new kernel module. Let's call it PP filter, for example. That module is a bit specific. It's not an, like a normal kernel module, it's a UMH. A UMH is a kind of module that will start a user space process from within the kernel. Uh, that has a lot of different benefits. It's not much used anymore. I'm not sure it was a lot, um, but PP filter used it. Uh, and the user mode helper, so the kernel, the module will be loaded into the kernel, a new process, user space process will be started from that module. Uh, and the benefit is that you can use your user space development tool to work on that user space process. So you can attach a debugger, uh, you can attach a profiler the same way, and the sa with, this with the same tool that you would use uh, in user space. And the good side is, if you're doing something wrong and your process crash, the kernel doesn't really care about it. Like it's not making the kernel unstable. Um, so when we've got that, what we can do now is modify the kernel. So modify basically the IP underscore subglue.c file. That file is responsible for mapping a get socop or set socop call to a specific function. So what we want to do is modify that file. So the IP tables get suck up and set suck up call are going to our new module and not to what they should go. And the final part, which is the biggest one is, so at this point, we are able to hijack the IP table call coming to the kernel and send those to the module. But now we need to do something with it. Uh, no, and it's it's quite a high level overview. Uh, so, yeah, so our module is receiving the content of the, like the payload of the get suck up and set suck up call. And now what we want to do is to simply use that payload, convert it in, into BPF instruction and load it into the kernel. That's not the easy, easiest step, but when you do that, that works. Um, so that was the theory when the project started um, a long time ago. Uh, and from there, there were a few patches submitted to the kernel. So the first one was from Alexei Starobotov, Dave Miller and Daniel Borgman, which are maintainers from the kernel, from different subsystem. And they merged the basic boilerplate of it, which is creating a process, having the, the kernel module, uh, and modifying Saglu to send the payload into the BP filter module. Uh, eventually, Dmitry Benchikov worked on it too, 
and added the whole capability to convert the payload into BPF wildcard. Uh, so he submitted a couple of patch series. Uh, none of them, none of them were merged, uh, and he moved on. And eventually, I took over the project and I tried to submit a V3. Um, the issue is that we quickly realized that having BP filter defined this way as a user mode helper in the kernel within a module um, can lead to some issues, which is, for example, you would handle IP tables but not NF tables or other uh, way to describe filtering rules. Um, and also, it's tightly tied to the way the kernel is developed. Um, the issue with that is because BP filter is a user space process, so it's user space code, and the kernel maintainers um, don't have much time to review code first. So when it's user space code, it's even harder, especially for a new project that is developing quite fast. Um, so we decided to move it to user space. And what it looks like now is basically this. So you would have the user space and kernel space. Uh, we can see BP filter in orange. Uh, sorry for the color blind then. Um, so the client will be IP tables or NF table, for example, and that client is linked to libbp filter. Uh, the library is a small, lightweight library used simply to interface with the client and to easily communicate with the daemon. Uh, and the daemon will be responsible for the whole like heavy lifting, converting the program, understanding the, the client's data, the set of rules, and also loading the BPF program uh, into the kernel to the different hooks. Um, so we talked about IP tables, and let's talk a bit about NF tables now because it's going to be relevant uh, at this point. Um, IP tables work differently from NF tables. Uh, NF uh, IP tables, sorry, uh, sends the whole rules into the kernel, and the kernel will interpret the rule and for each packet, go through each rule and apply it, check what matches or not, and act on it. NF tables is different because NF table relies on a VM running inside the kernel. So what NFT, the user space tool for NF table does is that it reads the content of the command line, converts it into net filter bytecode and send it to the kernel. So that's what we can see here in orange. It's what's going over the netlink socket from NF table to the kernel. Um, so it if, if we take some time, we can understand what's going on here. Um, but it, it's very close to like bytecode assembly, like we see kind of like the same words and stuff. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's one of the main uh, difference. Uh, it uses bytecode, so it runs inside the VM in the kernel, and the other one is being uh, that NFT use Netlink. Uh, so if we go back to libbp filter now with our NFT examples. So libbp filter is linked to NF table, the NFT binary, uh, and NFT will give it the bytecode, basically. What it would send to the kernel is not sent over the socket, it's sent to, it's given to libbp filter instead. And libbp filter won't do any manipulation of the data, it doesn't do much except for sending it over a Unix domain socket to the daemon, which we see uh, at the bottom of the slide. So it grabs the bytecode, puts all of that into a message with some metadata, like where is the message coming from, what kind of data is inside, and send it to the daemon. Uh, because of this, we can have a very lightweight and easy to integrate libbp filter, and that was the point of it. So now that the daemon is receiving the data, so at the top of the slide, we can see that the data is coming from libbp filter from the client. Um, and the daemon has different parts inside of it. So the translation part will be responsible for converting the client specific data, so NF tables or IP table data, data into a generic format used within the daemon itself. Uh, it's not aimed to be used outside, it's just internal stuff. When the translation is done, um, we can go to the data generation, which create the BPF program, and when we have the programs, we can load them to the kernel, and they will start um, filtering packets. So the translation is 
specific to the client. So if we use an app table, there is a what's called the front end within BP filter that will receive the the net filter bytecode and convert it into the format used within BP filter. Uh, having that architecture is quite useful because we can use when we have the generic data at the bottom and we want to create the BPF program, we can use the same function wherever the data is coming from. Uh, it makes it easy to um, back up the, the rules and save it somewhere and to save the state of the daemon. And it's also a way to later on be able to optimize the rule set. Uh, we can imagine that, for example, if you define 100 rules to filter 100 different IPs, BP filter will be able to put all that rules into a set and filter on the set directly instead of having 100 rules defined in the BPF program. Uh, so we have, using this, this mechanism of um, converting, converting the client specific format into generic format, we have a lot of different things possible later. So when we have the generic format here, we can start creating the BPF program. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see from the back there, so I'm sorry about that. Um, so we have the generic, uh, the generic rules inside BP filter format, and we can start creating the various BPF programs um, that will do the same processing as the rules. So that's basically a compil compilation step. Uh, we go from a specific format into BPF assembly, BPF instructions, and it starts with uh, what's called prolog. So BP filter is able to generate different different tip different types of BPF program, whether it's XBP, TC, or BPF net filter, which is more new. Um, and because you want to generate the rules the same way, whatever the program is, whatever the program type is, then you would have to have a prologue at the beginning to ensure that the arguments and the context is set up the same way for the different programs. Uh, for those who don't know about BPF that much, basically different program types allow you to attach to different locations in the kernel, but those program will have different arguments when run. Uh, and so we need to go from those different arguments and ensure that what we work on is the same for every program type. Um, so when we've done the prologue, we can start setting up the environment, like setting up like a context, um, creating a dynamic pointer to access the packet data and avoid running, like reading outside the packet, for example. Uh, we can continue with unrolling the, the, the rules. So we have 10 rules, for example, and we'll convert all the all those rules into BPF bytecode. Uh, one of the last steps will be to create the policy. So the policy is the default rule for a chain. Uh, the policy will see will say, for example, if no rule match, then I will be dropping every packet coming. And finally, BP filter is able to generate custom BPF functions. Um, so by the end of the program generated, it's able to create new function that can be called in the main program later. Uh, that's useful to avoid duplicating code and ensuring that the BPF bytecode generated is as small as possible. Uh, and finally, the epilogue, which is basically the same thing as the prologue, but for the return code. So XBP and TC, for example, have, have different opcode, meaning we accept or we drop the packet. So we need to be sure that if we want to accept it, uh, we put the right opcode in the return value for XBP or for TC. And when the whole generation step is complete, we can then see that if it's not too small, there is now a program in the structure written by uh, that step. So we now have our program available and we can just do the last step, which is loading the program and attaching into a, to a specific hook. Uh, so. Uh, sorry. So yeah, BP filter use the BPF subsystem in the kernel to load and attach the program. There will be one program for each interface, uh, except for the loopback one. This allows you to filter on the interface without having a unique program which would have to check the interface the packet is coming from. So that saves us from some branching if you use a lot of per interface filtering. 
uh, and the program is replaced atomically. So if you have a program running for a specific hook already for your front end, so if you create a filtering rule using NF table on the prerequisite hook, for example, and then you want to add another rule, then that program is updated and it's done atomically to avoid any downtime in the filtering. Uh, so I've got a demonstration if you want to see. Okay, is it big enough? No. Is it getting smaller? Okay, uh, I can't see what I'm doing right now. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, that <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? Okay, my keyboard was in French. My bad. Okay, that's better. Let's skip my test. Okay, is it better in the back for the right window? Okay, so I should. I'll be honest. Um, I don't see anything. Let me just do something quickly. Okay, I can see it now. So, sorry. So let's start first. Let's start BB filter. So the daemon we need to start it right. Um, we see a few options here. The first one is transient. Uh, for those who have used systemd, maybe that rings a bell. Basically, what this does is that it says to the daemon that don't keep any file on the file system uh, for the short explanation. The long one is BP filter by default will pin the BPF programs to the BPF subsystem, BPF file system, sorry. Uh, that allows the program, the daemon, to be restarted without losing the filtering. Uh, the transient state will say, well, don't pin anything. If we stop the daemon, then you remove the program. Uh, I guess the verbose one is quite explicit. And the last one is to disable uh, IP table support. So in that case, we would just have NF table support. So the daemon is started, it set up NF table, so that's right. Uh, so that daemon now is running on a VM. And what we're gonna do is I've got the terminal here on the bottom left trying to ping my VM, BB filter running in the VM, and we will run, uh, we will add a rule to filter out ICMP packets within, um, within the VM. So I should have, yeah. I don't have to remember the whole command. So, okay, we start, we just started the daemon, so there's nothing here. If we list the content of the NF table rule set, there is, as we can see, nothing except a table. Now what we want to do is to add a chain. So a few things happen here. First of all, we create the chain. Uh, we want to call it pre-routing. We add it to our table. Uh, it's a chain, chain of type filter whatever, whatever, and we can see a default policy, uh, the last argument. So by default, the chain will accept every packet. Uh, another thing here, we can see the dash dash BPF option. That option is from actually a fork of, uh, of an F table I've got, which means use BP filter. So instead of sending the data to the kernel with netlink, it will just send the data with libbp filter to the daemon. And on the right side, what we can see is that we have the content of a codegen structure, which is a structure that goes through all the steps of translation, duration, and loading. It contains now a default policy, which is the one we set when creating the chain. And it also has two programs, one for each interface. And because I've got two interface, I've got two programs, except for the loopback one. Uh, and we can see the program has a name. It has a map attached which contains metadata. So each program created and loaded will have a map which contains metadata. And we can see it's not pinned anywhere. So that's because of the transient option. Now we want to add a rule to it. So that rule will tell NF table to drop every ICMP packet. 
and we see the counter option and the counter option will tell NF table to create counters for the number of packets and bytes matched by the rule. Well, it doesn't crash, so I guess it works, right? And we can see here there's no packets, um, there's no ping working anymore. So we actually catch the ping and drop it. But that's not just it, right? I want to see what's happening now. So if we dump the rule set, we can see there is a new rule and we can see that it's actually updating and we can see the number of packets and bytes filter out are uh, increasing. Um, and because BP filter creates like, like any other BPF program, we can use BPF, BPF tools to see what's going on. So we see two different programs which have the same name as the name found in the log on the right. And if we can, if we want to have a look, let's see what's inside of it. So that's the BPF bytecode. So I just printed the content of one of the program used to filter, and that's basically what uh, BP filter is creating. Uh, each instruction here is a structure, and BP filter will fill a memory buffer with that structure to have the like. The, the proper program in the end. Uh, and if we look closely, we can see this part here. So this part here is the rule we just added to drop ICMP packets. Uh, it starts line 87 and what it does is that it loads from the packet the protocol field. When it's got the protocol field in register 4, it's gonna check if it's the value one, which is the ICMP protocol. If it's not uh, equal, then it will just jump to the next rule. If it's equal, it can continue and call a custom functions, which will update the counter. It will then put the value, which mean drop for an XBP program in the written register and it exit the program. And because the BPF subsystem will see that the written value of the program is one, and because it's an XBP program, it knows that it needs to drop the packet. Any question on this part before I go back to the slides? Okay. All right. So that was the demonstration. Um, let's talk about performances a bit. So before discussing any further, uh, I must say that, th first of all, it's hard to do benchmarks, right? Uh, to do, to have like meaningful values from benchmarks. It's not easy. The other thing is that this one is specifically synthetic. Um, what we do here basically is we have two hosts uh, connected with a 10 gig link. So we can go up to 10 gigabits between the hosts. The first one will use packagem, the kernel module to generate traffic, fake traffic up to 10 gigabit per second. And the other one will just receive it and have a rule to drop all the coming traffic on the interface. And what we'll do is that add more and more rule before that dropping rule. The rules before are just useless. We just want to go through it and see the overhead of every rule. Um, but I'm it, it, I, I say you need to take this one with a grain of salt and it's synthetic because you wouldn't do this, actually. Um, maybe you would do this with IP table, but not with an NF table. What you would do instead of having a thousand rules to filter on thousand of IPs, you would have one rule to filter on a set of IPs. Um, but I've used this one anyway because BP filter doesn't yet support sets of rules, so we can't say here's like five IPs, and you need to filter on all those IPs. Uh, so it. I wanted to compare BP filter and F tables uh, apples to apples. So that was the only way to do it for now. Uh, and it, that's giving us some value. Um, so we can see that NF tables and IP tables are dropping in bandwidth earlier than BP filter. So what we are doing here for IP tables and NF tables is that we add the rules to the pre routing hook, uh, and BP filter is adding the rules, creating the program to be attached to the XBP hook. So that explains the difference. Instead of having to, so 
because we attach the program to XTP, the program is filtered as soon as it, as it arrives on the NIC. And the kernel doesn't have to allocate any memory for it. For IP tables and NF tables, the hook is located later. So at this point, the kernel had to go through like routing, uh, well, not routing because it's pre-routing, but like it has to go through allocation of memory to store the packets and to go through the stack, the, the networking stack of the packets, of the kernel, sorry. Um, but another thing that's interesting here is that by default, even with just one rule, which is drop every packet, BP filter is faster than IP tables and MF tables. And the difference here over 10 gigabits is around 200 megabits. Uh, and that difference is due to, again, XDP, because we don't have to allocate memory for packets, we can just drop it as soon as it arrives. Uh, so, what, now that we talked about it a bit more, what can it actually do right now? So, for now, I've got two forks, uh, one of IP tables and one of NF tables, and those two forks are able to use uh, BP filter with a dash dash BP um, flag. Uh, and for IP tables and IP tables legacy and NF table, uh, it's able to filter packets based on the source or destination IP, same for the ports, uh, filter on protocol, as we've seen just before. Uh, you can filter on the source interface also. Uh, and it can collect uh, statistics from the various rules defined. Uh, so it can create SDP, TC, and BPF net filter program types. Uh, the BPF net filter program types is quite new. It's from last April, um, and it allows the BPF program to be attached to the same hooks as IP tables. Um, and finally, uh, the program defined will use KFunk and BPF helpers. They can create custom functions, um, and they use dynamic pointers to avoid reading the packets uh, directly. Uh, and what is going on? So IPv6, so we are coming back to the IPv4 question from before. So I'm working on support for IPv6 right now. Uh, support for set, so I would be able to compare NF tables to, IP ta to BP filter in a more useful way, let's say. Um, also, generation of the rule, partial generation of the rule to avoid regenerating the whole rule set every time. It's not, it, it's quite efficient already. Uh, like, it's not like you have to wait for the generation to be done. Um, the may, may but it would be better to um, not have to do that every time and just, if we made the rule and we translated the rule one time, we don't need to do it more, we just should store it and, and reuse it later. Um, and I'd like to add a generic client um, to be able to not be constrained by IP tables or NF table, to be able to use any hook you want and any feature you want. And finally, cgroup support to attach program to cgroup directly. Um, some links if you want to have a look. Uh, so there is the BP filter repository, uh, the forks for NF tables and IP tables. Uh, I tried to post some status reports and update of the project on my website. And finally, if you've got questions, I've got my email here. Do you have any questions? Hello, this is really cool, and Thanks. I'm curious about the, what are the hurdles that you're facing to get the forks of IP tables and NF tables, um, your changes upstream? Are there any road blockers that are making it difficult? To get that stuff upstream? Not to, yeah, to get it upstream, your yeah. forks. Uh, so, I'm, I'm working with the NF table people. Um, I've discussed with uh, Claudon Westphal, which is a maintainer of NF table, um, Netfilter, and he was interested into it for XDP or Plugin. So being able to use BP filter transparently from NFT to put your rule inside an, an XDP BPF program, uh, which would run earlier than anything in NF table. Yeah. And, and the benefit of it is quite transparent, I mean, 
you wouldn't have to allocate pa uh, memory for the packet and you can drop for example if you have to mitigate um, traffic attacks and that kind of thing you would drop the roof the packets as early as possible of course but yeah, it's in it's in progress I would say okay thank you so if you have um, set up one of these BTF program skew filtering and you have existing NFT rules will they layer or will it replace it so for now it, it exists together uh, basically so if you create a rule without the dash dash BTF option you update the NFT tables. If you add the dash dash BTF, you create a BTF program. Um, the NF table integration should be better and hopefully will be when working with the NF table people. Uh, for now, it's uh, it's not a proof of concept, but it's an idea of how it could integrate with it. Um. Why do you exactly need the daemon separately rather than just having like the NFT program call into a library that can do all the generation and then load it straight into the kernel? Because you pretty much have to run NFT as root anyways. So yeah. there's no privilege separation required for that. The, the issue is that you need to keep state. Um, so when I, let's go back to the, okay, so this part. When I received the NetFilter bytecode, I need to translate it into the internal format. And I don't want to do it the other way around. So I keep it aside and I update it if needed. But I don't want to just recreate it. So I save it into the context of the, of the daemon. And it's even worse with IP table legacy because the format is very, very specific. And it's difficult to go back from BPF to that format. So that's a way to... Um, that's a way to, to save time and effort and, and not to pull my hair trying to go back the other way. Um, another solution would have been to have just a library and to create a BPF map to store that kind of data, but it's not made for it. So that was the best solution I could find. Okay, uh, I mean, another option might be to have like a on disk cache area that the library just knows where to look. Yeah, but that's like where the right way to put the cache. Is it meaningful to have like the cache and, and that data stored in the cache itself? And I, 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 I don't know if it's, if it's a better solution. Uh, that's the one I picked um, and it works fine for me. What's XDP? Uh, XDP is so in that case, it's the hook uh, located on the network interface. So when you attach a program to XDP, you attach it to the network interface directly. So you have the packet as early as possible when it's still in the buffer of the network shard. Thank you very much. Thank you.